this. So you want to open with prayer, Walter? Oh, yes, we can. Father Pang and Musselham, Father. Father Raven, Elijah, for you. Father Stoll. Our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. We thank you for this time you set aside and we'll come and examine yet another portion on the 25th day. Pray that when we got in directly, we might be instructed. We might learn from the things of the past that we need not to repeat them. Prepared for the challenges as soon as I sign for soon return. We thank you for these many blessings you've given to us, especially this class to come together. And ask for your guidance upon those who are in special need to help them through the challenges they face. Thank you for all things to learn about Son Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm glad you're here. And we are actually going back to the second ecclesia, which was Smyrna and all of the persecution that they went through. So we're now under the fifth persecution. So last time we were talking, we covered um, the fourth one, which you, you probably remember. This is the arena in uh, Lyon, France, where they were persecuted. Um, <coughs> all the persecutions under Marcus Aurelius in 162 um, AD. So there was a lot of those. And now we're up to the fifth, um, which is under, uh, I have to minimize this for a second, under Servius in 192. Now the important for us thing to remember about all this is first it was persecuted because it was mainly a pagan culture and it was switching over to a Christian culture. So, so far we've been studying this. What did persecuting the church actually do? Did it make it deteriorate or grow bigger? It made it grow bigger. That's exactly right. When they persecuted the Hebrews in Egypt because they were afraid of them and made them into slaves and oppressed them, what happened to them? They started growing bigger and multiplying. They started having babies. Lots and yeah. lots of babies. <laughs> multiplying. <laughs> Yep. So they, they grew too. So what's interesting is, is when there's no pressure on Christianity, what happens? You get a lazy, fair attitude. And, yeah. I know. It's a lazy, fair attitude. And people walk away from God. They stop attending Thursday night class. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, that's, that's what I want you to pick up on is the patterns. I don't expect you to remember all this history because it's a lot. Um, but I want you to know what happened to these people because they paid the price for us to have our freedom today. Yes, Christ is the overarching sacrifice. <laughs> these people literally followed in the cross footsteps of Christ. They, they went to God. Golgotha, and they, they lost their lives for their faith. That will probably never happen to any of us, but it happened to them. Um, so, Patsy, do you feel comfortable reading this one? Um, let me see. Well, I, I got to find some glasses here. Small. Well, Linda, can you read it while she's getting I her? got it. Oh, you got it? Okay. The fifth persecution under service. Service having been recovered from a severe fit of sickness by a Christian became a great favor of the Christians in general, but the prejudice and fury of the ignorant multitude prevailing, obsolete laws were put in execution against the Christians. The progress of Christianity alarmed the pagans and they revived the state sorry, colony of placing accidental mis calamity of placing accidental misfortunes to the account of its professors, AD 92. But the, the, through persecution, malice raged, yet the gospel shone with replendent brightness and firm as an impregnable rock withstood the attacks of its 
boisterous enemies with success. Well, this is Tert Tertullian. Tertullian. Tertullian was a major writer. Okay, was lived, who lived in the age, inform us that in if the Christians had collectively withdrawn themselves from the Roman territories, the empire would have been greatly depleted, depopulated. Okay, so what they're saying is, is that it had spread so fast and so far that if all Christians left the Roman empire at that time, there would be hardly any populace left. So what did we have? A very vocal minority still trying to run the show, right? What's happening today with our vocal minority? Who is the vocal minority today? Christianity is still the major religion of the United States. Yeah. We're not nearly as vocal as the liberal left. And oh, no, not at all. They're pushing their laws on us. They're pushing their agendas on us, and they're not doing it with religious intent. They're doing it under political correctness. They're doing it under the auspices of everybody being created equal. They're doing it under the auspices of democracy, when in fact, it isn't equal. It would be if everybody surrendered to Christ, because he is the, he is the complete eliminator of racism and sexism. Who else came on? Helen. I can't see, huh? Helen. Hey, Helen, how are you? Good evening, Helen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, this is just- uh, Hi, I'm sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. It's okay, we're glad you're here. <laughs> it's a smaller crowd tonight. Everybody else is at amusement parks, you know. <laughs> I can't compete with that level of entertainment. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so we're, we're into the fifth persecution under Servius. All 10 of these from the emperors against Christianity in the early Roman Empire fall under the Smyrna epic, which is the persecuted church. So there's 10 of them, and we're halfway there with number five. Um, so the next one is so it starts with the Victor Bishop of Rome suffered martyrdom in the first year of the third century in AD 2000, sorry, 201. Um, Leondus was the father of celebrated Origen who was beheaded for, for being a Christian. Many other of Origen's hearers likewise suffered martyrdom, particularly two brothers named Plutarchus and Ser Servinus, another Servinus, Heron and Heracles were beheaded. Um, Ryan has, sorry, Rias has boiled pitch poured over his head and was then burnt, uh, as was Marcella, her mother. Um, Fontaine Erna, the sister of Roas, was executed in the same manner as Roas had been, but Vestales, an officer belonging to the army, um, and ordered to attend her execution became a convert. So we talked about this earlier that whenever there's a persecution like this, more people begin to believe because if one of us were to be martyred for our beliefs, say, <laughs> I will, I'll just use myself because that way I won't cause any offense, but whatever do I ran or the Middle East, I should say, and just was a small mission trip and you heard I got shot while I was over there. Would it strengthen your belief or would it hurt your belief? Well, you don't have to come to my funeral or anything. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, no, it's just, I think that it strengthens our faith when other people go through trials because we realize how deep the belief is and how dedicated they are. Um, so that really does help. And, and in they, these scenarios, there's one right after, right after the other. Mm. So, um, Helen, would you like to read the Matthew at the bottom? Matthew 13, 21. Yet he has no root in himself, but is short-lived. 
when pressure or persecution becomes or comes because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So where is that from? I was going to say, everything you're talking about mirrors and parallels the parable of the sower of the seeds. Yep. The sower of the seeds is, you know, if, if there's any persecution at all to be suffered, they fall right away. And it was like, nah, well, this is not for me. There's not going to be any self-sacrifice. These people were the true root that, you know, took their stand and wouldn't be moved. And it's pretty hard to find this, this kind of uh, theology today. Um, Helen, you want to read this one? Oh, try 10 persecutions by against Christianity. <clears throat> the fifth persecution under Servius, AD 192, Basilius being as an officer required to take a certain oath, refused, saying that he could not swear by the Roman idol as he was a Christian. Struck with surprise, the people could not at first believe what they heard. But he had no sooner confirmed the same than he was dragged before the judge, committed to prison, and speedily afterward beheaded. Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyons, was born in Greece and received both a polite and a Christian education. It is generally supposed that the account of the persecutions at Lyon was written by himself. He, su he succeeded the martyr Pontinius as Bishop of Lyons and ruled his diocles with great propriety. He was a zealous opposer of heresies in general, and about AD 187, he wrote a celebrated, celebrated tract against heresy. Victor, the Bishop of Rome, wanting to impose the keeping of Easter there in preference to other places, it occasioned some disorders among the Christians. In particular, Irenaeus wrote him a, help me, not, how do you say that? Epistle, epistle, yeah. In the name of the Gallic okay. churches. Thank you. This zeal in favor of Christianity Ported, <clears throat> pointed him out as an object of resentment to the emperor, and in AD 202, he was beheaded. Yep, so if these people stood up for their beliefs, if they stood against any kind of the authority at the time, they were just simply beheaded. So we've moved past crucifixions <coughs> and lighting people on fire like torches and moved on to beheadings. Um, and there's, there's part of this you probably don't, not as familiar with, with. If you were beheaded, what do they believe happened to your soul? In Roman times. Okay, we'll look it up on your phone and, and uh, just shout it out when you look it up and find it out, okay? What did the Romans believe? What did the pagan Romans believe happened to you if you were beheaded? <clears throat> I just want you to think about that because there's all kinds of weird stuff. Like um, the, the Catholics told everybody, if you commit suicide, you couldn't be buried in their cemetery. Your soul was lost. Um, you know, all this, all these things, it was really awful, but they were all fake beliefs. So if you want to look up on your phone, what did, did Roman uh pagans believe happened to you if you were beheaded so i'd love to hear what you think or what you find out um patsy you want to read this one i think it's fairly easy easy and his name is <clears throat> Basilides. okay Basilides. okay um the fifth fifth persecution under service uh, Basilias being as an officer required to take a certain oath, refusing saying that he could not swear by Roman idols as he was a Christian, struck, the, struck with surprise. The people could not at first believe what they heard, but he had no sooner confirmed this than he was dragged before the judge and committed to prison and speedily afterwards beheaded. Afterwards beheaded. The picture was no. in the way. <laughs> oh, that's fine. So th these are some of the ways that, that Christians were killed for their beliefs in the first and second century AD. Um, you know, hung up 
upside down and beheaded. This guy up at the top, they basically allowed scorpions and um, snakes to bite them so many times. This other guy in the ground is being buried alive in the ground. Yeah. And then the other guy, one, one guy is holding him and the other one's removing his large intestines. So um, that was also practiced by some North American Indians was to, and this was a thing, they would choke you with your own entrails, basically. So they thought that was particularly fun. Um, did anybody look it up on their phone? I don't have a phone with me. <laughs> It's fine. So anyway, I'll read this one because it's long and tedious. The persecutions now extending to Africa, many were martyred in that quarter of the globe, the most particular of whom we shall mention, Perpetua and a married lady about 22 years old. Those who suffered with her were Felicitas, a married lady, um, she was with child at the time being apprehended and Revocatus um, Catuchum of Carthage and a slave. The names of the other prisoners um, destined to suffer upon this occasion were Sadernius, uh, Segundulus, and Sator. On that day appointed of their execution, they were led to the amphitheater, Satyr, Satyrinus, and Revocatus uh, were ordered to run the gauntlet between the hunters, or such as had care of wild beasts. The hunters being drawn up into two ranks, they ran between and were severed, severely lashed as they passed. Um, Felicitas and Perpetua were stripped in order to be thrown to a mad bull, which made his first attack upon Perpetua and stunned her and then darted at Felicitas and gored her dreadfully, but not killing them. The executioner did that office with a sword. Um, Revocatus and Sator were destroyed by wild beasts. Saturinus was beheaded and Segundus died in prison. These executions were in 205 AD on the eighth day of March. So it's pretty amazing how these things happened. So in Thessalonians, it says, in fact, when we were with you, we told you previously, we were not going to suffer persecutions. Sorry, that we were going to suffer persecutions, as you know, has happened. Um, so I wanna say the persecutions against believers has always happened from Abel all the way through. They killed all the prophets. They killed all the messengers sent to them. And then even in Christianity, it went to just the regular believers. Anybody who professed to be a believer was treated in this way. So Perpetua and Felicitas were um, very brave women who died pretty horrible death. Um, Spiritus and 12 others were likewise beheaded, as was Andeses in France. Sorry, Asil Piatti, Piatti's, Piatti's Bishop of Antioch suffered many tortures, but his life was spared. Cecilia, a young lady from a good family in Rome, was married to a gentleman named Val Valeria. She converted her husband and brother, who were beheaded, and the Maximus or officer who led them to the execution, becoming their convert, suffered the same fate. Um, so in other words, because of their death, he became a believer, but they beheaded him as well. The lady was placed naked in a scalding bath and having continued there a considerable time, her head was struck off with a sword, AD 222. Um, Callistus, the Bishop of Rome was martyred in 221 but in the manner of death, it is not recorded until Urban, the, the Bishop of Rome, met the same fate in 320, uh, sorry, 232. So this is what I also meant to put up here, and I was going to put a big cycle. So here's what happens. I have the Church of Rome, mainly the, the Church of Rome, uh, 
persecutes these people and kills them. And then there's a period where they're just the, the dead. Then the story comes to light again. And what do they do with these people who died for their faith? They say, oh, they were really martyrs and now you can pray to them and they're saints. So they're canonized, they're made into a saint and people can start praying to them. So they turn the literally the death that they caused around and do something completely different with it. So in Acts 11, uh, 19, the Catholic, sorry, the church in Antioch, those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the message uh, to no one except Jews. So the persecutions that were suffered by Stephen spread out all over the world. So they're just letting us know in one verse that this was going to happen and did happen. And we're reading about it here. Um, what, what followed after the Bible was completed of those who, who went through this. Hey, Joseph. Yeah. Amanda and Johnny are here now. We were late. Sorry. How are you? We're good. Good to see you. We don't know if you could see us or not. We are, Our computer's not being funny. Yeah, we can see you. You're wearing a hat that does not match your shirt at all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, camouflage and stripes. D, D, the deer won't see you at all. He was he was outside washing the car, and I was talking to my mom, and I was like, oh my gosh, it's 7.10. I got to go. I did not even realize what time it was. No, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. It was, I think a lot of people are vacationing and traveling today, so I was glad you're here. So we're, yeah. we're covering the um, 10 persecutions by the emperors against Christianity, <laughs> and now we're in the sixth of the, of the series of these. So it all corresponds to the Smyrna epic of time, because that was the persecuted church. If we look at back to Revelations, Maybe we should read that one more time just so everybody's on the same page. Can somebody read this, uh, chapter three, beginning of chapter three or end of chapter two about the letter to Smyrna? This one, this slide. That an open invitation I'll read it. Sit. what what do you want to read again the letter to smyrna hold on it's john yeah. it should be at the end of chapter two of revelations or the beginning of chapter three. Oh, johnny's got it i got it <clears throat> i wonder where it is i was just getting to it so, uh wait thyatira uh pardon. it's right after uh, ephesus is the first one there it is for the document hold on it should be the one right after verse eight, verse eight. yeah yeah to the angel in the church of Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your affliction and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you, uh, I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at, by the second death at all. Very good. Thank you so much. So we've been reading about all these cases of what's going on. And this is a transitional period between the pagan Roman world going to a Christian Roman world. So there was a lot of resistance um, to this. <coughs> so Johnny, you wanna read this slide? Yes, uh, from the second Thessalonians part. Yep, and then the, the one that's in Burgundy next to it. Second Thessalonians 1, 4. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you among God's churches about your endurance and faith and all the persecutions and inflictions that you endure. Now, the sixth persecution under Max, Maximus, A.D. 235 through 235 A.D., I mean, basically one year, 
was in the time of Max Max Min Max Maxim Maximinus. Sorry. Um, in Cappadocia, the president Ceraminus. Uh, Ceraminus. Yeah. Ceraminus did all he could to exterminate the Christians from that province. The principal persons who perished under the, this reign were Pon, Pontine, or Pontinus yes. of uh, Rome and Teros, a Grecian, his successor who gave offense to the government by collecting the acts of the martyrs, Pum, uh, Pum, and Quirinius, Pumachius, Pumachius, and uh, Quiritus, um, okay. Roman senators with all their families and many other Christians, Simplicius, Senator uh, Calipo, yeah, Calipodius, Calipodius, a Christian minister thrown into the Tiber, Martina, a noble and beautiful virgin, and Hippolytus, a Christian prelate, uh, tied to a wild horse and dragged until he expired. Okay, so a lot of the people in the Roman world had Roman god names, okay? We know this to be true. Some were tied to mythology and some were just gods okay so we see this even in the bible paul says say hello to apollo for me and to this person and they all have roman god names okay so this guy hippolytus if you look at that up on your phone and you look up horse you come up with this picture in the bottom left so it's part of roman mythology okay this guy had that name okay so when they decided how he was going to die they borrowed from his own name so they killed him the way that the roman guy died uh hippolytus um and i just found that so fascinating because i was looking for pictures of how this guy was persecuted and i kept winding up with this picture of this Roman who went through this is it is in several paintings. Um, and I was like, why is this together? And finally, I pieced it together in my brain. They pro probably decided this was the best way to kill him because he was named after this guy. So I just thought that was really interesting. It's like if your name was Christ and they decided to kill you by crucifixion, or if your name was uh, what's his name? Achilles, they're going to drop you in a river or whatever. <laughs> or Herodotus or whatever. They all had fates of what happened to them. So does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, I have a comment about that. Something interesting that like Johnny brought to my attention about just about the DC area that I never thought of before. Okay. Um, if you look at our monuments here in DC, mm -hmm. They're so similar to the Roman monuments, right? Like, yep. Because uh, Jefferson, in his rotunda, was copied by the architect who did the Jefferson Memorial. So it's right. supposed to look like the Pantheon. Right. So if you just think about that in a different light for a minute, like, if it was we're, bad then. we're treating <laughs> the, like, if, if you think, about an, uh, if you think about a civilization thousands of years from now, looking back at our history, right? Mm -hmm. What would they think about these monuments? Well, they're secular anyway. Right? That we borrowed heavily from the Romans. <laughs> would they think that we thought these people were gods because we, we built these? Oh, yeah. If it was buried under earth and we unearthed it from an archaeological perspective, we would be like, oh my goodness, these people must be, you know, the most incredible quintessential examples of the entire society. So Lincoln 
Jefferson, you know, Washington would stand head and shoulders above all else. And it just makes me think back to these, because I, I studied Latin a lot in high school, and it makes me think back to just our are we doing the same thing to these yeah. cultures? Like, oh, yeah, we are, we are. Everybody lionizes the people of their own generation um, throughout history. So every generation puts forth, these are the best actors now. These are the best politicians. These were the best statesmen. These were the best, you know, doctors and scientists and all this kind of stuff. But the people who get venerated are, are very few times the ones who really should be venerated. But anyway, <clears throat> so I was asking earlier because the, they beheaded so many of the people before this, this example, you know, they drag him behind a horse till he dies. Um, but in previous examples, they beheaded a lot of people. So I was trying to ask everyone, and maybe you know, Amanda, if you were a pagan Roman, and someone was beheaded, what was that person who was beheaded's fate for the future, for the afterlife? What happened to their soul? I believe there is- They would go to Hades and they would be in the bad part, right? Not the- uh, They wouldn't go to the Elysian fields. They wouldn't go to the Elysian fields. Wouldn't be positively Elysian. It wouldn't be a timeshare <laughs> in Hades. They, would, they wouldn't get, they wouldn't have a golden coin to get past Cerberus. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing I'm looking for was what was their belief? And because I they, they used it so frequently and I'm like, why did they keep beheading the Christians? And it must be tied to their own pagan beliefs of what they thought would happen to them in the afterlife. So well, tell, tell us that whole narrative again, because I want to make sure I understand it. I, I, so like, hold on a second. I actually know why. So a lot, if you're a Roman citizen, they didn't uh, kill you like they killed, um, I guess, foreigners or whatever. They were, they like beheading was considered more merciful and beheading you was like, for example, they did it to royalty. Paul was a Roman citizen. So the Catholic church believes that he was beheaded uh i mean that's what tradition says right and um I, i'm looking at it from the perspective because these were raging pagans that were part of the roman empire right i was looking for yeah but if you're a citizen i know that the, for a fact so, that they beheaded you because it was like the more civilized way to kill somebody like generals that were were killed yeah, that's true i mean they, they invented the guillotine later on but that wasn't pagan culture that came up with it for community i yes. was looking for more what what amanda was saying because this that was the belief of what was going to happen to you in the afterlife for being beheaded so go ahead amanda super again. interesting because actually like my latin teacher was so obsessed with this culture that she actually told us that she wanted to be buried this way mm that she wanted to be buried with a coin in her mouth and a bread piece of bread in her hand because you needed the coin and you, you needed the coin to pat to give to the boatmaster on the river Styx and you needed the bread to give to Cerberus to subdue him to be able to get by him Oh, because he would devour your soul or what? Isn't that right, Amanda? They thought Cerberus would devour you if you did not provide the bread? Right. And then I guess like you were trapped in, um, I can't remember what it's actually called, but it's, I guess, like the equivalent of purgatory for Catholics. No, like limbo. You're beheading a less dishonorable yeah. form of execution than other. Yeah, I just think that helps us understand why they chose to do it this way so often. Okay. Um, Amanda, you want to read this one? Uh, struggles in Christian life, 10, but you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance. 
11, along with persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from them all, 12. In fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I think this is um, Paul's writing in Corinthians, so I'm sorry I didn't put the, the title. Those are the verse numbers, sorry. <laughs> um because I'm, I'm trying to, to follow this along with scripture so you can see everybody predicted for, for believers they were going to be persecuted after these days. So um, I'm just trying to show how it all correlates and dovetails with what I'm showing you from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Good. Um, the sixth persecution under Maximus 80 to 35 during this persecution raised by Max, Maximinus Numberless Christians were slain without trial and buried indiscriminately in heaps. Sometimes fifty or sometimes fifty or sixty being cast into a pit together, without the least decency. The tyrant Maximinus dying A.D. 238 was succeeded by Gordian, who during his reign and that of his successor Philip. The church was free from persecution for the space of more than 10 years. But in AD 249, a violent persecution broke out in Alexandria at the instigation of a pagan priest without the knowledge of the emperor. Well, so there was a 10 year period of peace, but Maximinus did so much damage until he died. And that was a three year basically reign of terror um, and then the violence breaks out again in Alexandria um, later on. So this this stuff was incredible because they're literally buried in heaps. Um, so it's it's pretty crazy. The dog is getting a good grooming over there. That's Sasha. That's Sasha. Yes, this this is Sasha. Sasha's driven away Amanda and John. You see that? <laughs> She's scared to death of him. Okay, so I'll go on to the next one. Um, let's see. Joanne, do you think you can do this one? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, we'll split this up between you and Joe. Can you do this one? Joanne and Joe. I'll go do one of them. 23, are they servants of Christ? I'm talking like a madman. I'm a better one with far more labors, many more imprisonments, <coughs> far worse beatings, near death, many times. 24, five times I received 39 lashes from Jews, 25, three you times. Have, you, don't, you don't have to read the numbers. That's just the verse numbers. Oh, okay. Just, just keep reading the, the text. Okay. Three times I was beaten with rods by the Romans. Once I was stoned by my enemies. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the open country, dangers in the, on the sea, and dangers among false brothers labor and hardships, many sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, often without food, cold and lacking clothing. I, I don't know that I could have gone through any of those things, much less floating on the open sea for three days. Doing on the left. I can't even do it for one day. Hmm. Go ahead. Seventh persecution. This was occasioned partly by the hatred he bore to his predecessor Philip, who was deemed a Christian, but was part, but was partly by his jealousy concerning the amazing increase of Christianity, for the heathen temples began to be forsaken, and the Christian churches thronged. These reasons stimulated Decimus, Decius to attempt the very extirpation of the name of Christian. And it was unfortunate for the gospel that had many errors, that many errors had about this time crept into the church. 
the Christians were at variance with each other. Self-interest divided those whom social love ought to have united. And the virulence of pride occasioned a variety of factions. The heathens in general were ambitious to enforce the imperial decrees upon this occasion and looked upon the murder of a Christian as a merit to themselves. The martyrs on this occasion were innumerable, but the principle we shall give some account of. Fabian, the Bishop of Rome, was the first person of eminence let's see, who, who felt the severity of this persecution. The deceased Emperor Philip had, on his integrity, committed his treasure to the care of this good man. But Decius, not finding as much as his avarice made him expect, determined to wreak his vengeance on the good prelate. He was accordingly seized, and on January 20th, 8250, he suffered decapitation. Yep, he sure did. So, off with his head. Go ahead. I said, off with his head. And that's the picture on the left-hand side. It's supposed to be <clears throat> um, a picture of someone like trying to pick up their head. But anyway, I think that's that's sort of ludicrous. But anyway, um, this this is another one of those examples of greed causing people to dis, um, besmirch other people's good character to take their money from them. Uh, but also it shows you, even in the second and third century AD, there's a time when Christians themselves caused their own internal problems by their self-interest dividing them and also pride causing a variety of, of factions within the church. So that's why humility is so important. If you get prideful, you get division, strife, and, and problems. And that's why we all need to look out for each other's interests. Um, yeah, I think go ahead. also think about like when we talk about the idea of um, this, uh, what do the Catholics call it? martyrdom or the the place you go before you go to hell purgatory. Purgatory. purgatory when you think about this idea of purgatory like i think that we also have to be careful of this idea as well um as as christians or christadelphians like the idea that you can sin a little bit right like we have to be very careful of this idea of the devil's first idea that you can you know it's okay to eat it, you, you surely will not die right like we have to be very careful of this because just like the same idea of the golden coin and the and the and the pound cake you you can't um it, it's not that easy to just have a, a simple pass to get through to heaven right like to the kingdom right it's definitely not that easy and uh it's something that we struggle with all the time and yeah i just i just wanted to throw that out there yeah it's very easy to have a license to sin but we as believers don't and what's funny is is that the people in the world know how we should behave and whenever we step outside of that, they're the first ones to point it out, <laughs> which I think is kind of amusing. So we're always being watched, whether we like that or don't, um, for how we behave. So I know there's inconsistencies in my life, and I'm always trying to root them out. So that was a very good point. This one is Julian, a native of <clears throat> Sicilia. They were informed by Christophum. Um, was seized upon being a Christian. He was put into a leather bag together with a number of serpents and scorpions and in that condition thrown into the sea. So they not only killed him, but all the snakes and scorpions. <laughs> it would have been a miserable, horrible death either way. Um, drowning would probably have been a blessing at that point in time. Um, so this is an example. It's not from the history that I, I couldn't find a picture for this particular incident. So I am showing you an 18th century drawing 
to illustrate the point. So it does not go with the text. It is just an example to show you how this kind of death happened. Um, Johnny, would you like to read this one? Yeah. The, um, Peter, a young man, amiable for the superior qualities of his body and mind, was beheaded for refusing to sacrifice to Venus. He said, I am astonished you should sacrifice to an infamous, to an infamous woman whose debaucheries even your own historians record and whose life consisted of such actions as your laws would punish. No, I shall offer the true God the acceptable sacrifice of praises and prayers. Optimus, the proconsul of Asia, on hearing this, ordered the prisoner be stretched upon a wheel by which all his bones were broken, and then he was sent to be beheaded. Yeah, I mean, it's just a horrible thing. And this, Peter's a very knowledgeable guy. He's like, what? You want me to sacrifice to Venus? I'm not doing that. Um, she was such a nasty, disgusting woman, you know, with all these debaucheries. Your own historians record this and you're going to sacrifice to her? And he's like, even if she was alive today and did the things she did, according to your historians, you would have arrested her and punished her. And so rather than listen to his good argument that makes great sense, they're like, um, no, we're going to beat you on a wheel until you're practically dead. Then we're going to kill you or, or behead you. So being on the rack in this manner, that's where the phrase comes from, is from being fastened to a wheel. And that was the commonplace object in those days um, and literally broken apart with a, with a rod until there was nothing left. So uh, it's just amazing to me. So anyway, um, pretty incredible what people went through for their beliefs. But I think his argument is just incredible about Venus. I just was like, this is brilliant. Amanda, did you have any Latin uh, comment on this one? No, Johnny, I think has them. Um... No, he doesn't. Hold on, sorry. The, sorry, the kids are going nuts. I think Johnny from his, Johnny has a different background than than I have. And he has like a totally different perspective because he grew up in the Catholic Church and okay. has studied so much uh history and Catholicism and the um not just all of this history that we're that we're studying here, but also the um, relevancy, I guess, of how it relates to Jesus and Christians. Yeah, and I just think so many people stood up for what Christ did and Christ said over and over again, pick up your cross and follow me. And these people literally did that. Yeah. They, they followed through to the very, very end. Um, Helen, you wanna read this one? Okay. Um, let's see. Niche watch this. Niche watch this. Yeah. yeah, that man <laughs> being brought before the proconsul as a Christian was ordered to sacrifice to the pagan idols. Nick Montrus replied, I cannot pay that respect to devils, which is only due to the Almighty. This speech so much enraged the proconsul that Nick Hawk Montrus. <laughs> was put to the rack. After enduring the torments for a time, he recanted, but scarcely had he given this proof of his frailty, frailty, then he fell into the greatest agonies, dropped down on the ground and expired immediately. He died. Yes. Um, so in these cases, you know, they, they again try to present good logic. It was like, why are, gonna, why are you forcing us to offer these sacrifices to pagan idols when they're just devils. You know, the only one that deserves any anybody's respect is the Almighty. And then they he got basically the same treatment being put on the rack. So that seems to be the more popular one now. And um, <clears throat> Amanda, would you mind reading this slide? Oh, she's gone. Let's see. Um, Patsy, you want to try this one? 
Sure. You do you want me to read both? Yeah. Acts 14, 19. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and when they had won over the crowds and stoned Paul, they dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. Denicia, a young woman of only 16 years of age, was be, beheld, who beheld this terrible judgment, suddenly exclaimed, Oh, unhappy wretch, my, why would you buy a moment's ease at the expense of a, of a miserable, miserable eternity. eternity? Optimus, hearing this, called to her, and Danessa, avowing herself to be a Christian, she was beheaded by his order soon after. Andrew and Paul, two companions of Nico Marchus the Martyr, AD 2, 251, suffered martyr, martyrdom by stoning and expired, calling on their blessed Redeemer. Alex, Alexander and Imachus of Alexandria were apprehended for being Christians and confess, confessing their ac accusation were beat with staves yeah, and torn pegs. with hooks and at length burnt in the fire and were informed in a were informed in a fragment preserved by Eusebius and four female martyrs suffered on the same day at the same place but not in the same manner for they were beheaded. <laughs> You all right, Helen? That's not me. Oh, who is it? I don't know. I hope whoever it is is okay. Oh, so it's a, it's amazing what these people went through. And this one from Acts is always so amazing to me. Then some Jews came from Antioch to Iconium. And when they had won over the crowds and stoned Paul, they dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. Um, so it's just so awful. What people have had to suffer for for christ and, <clears throat> and what's amazing to me is that america has painkillers for everything and half of america is on some kind of <laughs> painkiller of one kind or another these people had nothing to uh, address the absolutely jarring pain they would have gone through with the way they went uh, i can't even imagine suffering the things that they've done um, so pretty incredible sorry I'm gonna repeat um so this is interesting because they actually have this um sarcophagus for these uh two who died and it's the three stages of their death which i think is interesting portrayed in in this thing i guess they pulled it out of the wall of wherever it was to take a picture of it um johnny are you okay with reading this one yeah sorry the <laughs> well I, I love your kids they're lots of fun normally they uh they literally all took off their like two of them took off their diapers and were running around with the mess everywhere <laughs> and i walked out there and i was like oh no <laughs> Oh my God! So you guys, you have a lot of cleaning supplies in the house, like Windex and 401. And what are you guys doing? <laughs> um, I clean up half of it. Is doing the rest now. So, okay. During the 14th century, the veneration of the holy martyr Saint Lucian and Marcian received a considerable boost in Vic. What is Vic? Uh, this urn depicted above contained the relics which were venerated in the old chapel of St. Saturni, or Saturni, um, later absorbed by the church of La Pietà. La Pietà. Um, the front contains the depiction of three episodes from their lives. Thus, the first scene left presents us with Lucian and Marcian using the diabolical arts attempt insistently and fruitlessly a pure and chaste maiden. Uh, the second scene center shows 
the moment when Lucian and Marcion, by now converted to Christianity, are led before the pra the praetor, uh, Sab Sabinus, who interrogates them and condemns them. In the third scene, uh, we see the scene of their martyrdom in which they we find an early portrayal of the icon iconographical formula that would eventually impose itself in the depiction of the holy martyrs tied to a column surrounded by flames. <clears throat> Lucian and Marcion, two wicked pagans, those skillful magicians, becoming converts to Christianity to make amends for their former errors, live the lives of hermits. The, uh, and subsisted upon bread and water only. After some time spent in this manner, they became zealous preachers and made many converts. Uh, the persecution, however, raging at this time, they were seized upon and carried before Sabinius. The governor of Bithynia. <laughs> sorry, um, Sabinus. Sabina, sorry, the governor of Bithynia, sorry. On being asked by what authority they took upon themselves to preach, Lucian answered that the laws of charity and, humili and uh, humanity uh, obliged all men to endeavor the conversion of their neighbors and to do everything in their power to rescue them from the snares of the devil. Lucian, having answered in this manner, Marcion said, their conversion was by the same grace which was given to St. Paul, who, from the zealous persecution of the church, became a preacher of the gospel. The proconsul, finding that he could not prevail with them to renounce this faith, condemned them to be burnt alive, and, sent, uh, and the sentence was soon after executed. So the importance of studying people like this is, this is two ordinary people who were totally worldly before. I mean, they, they were into the dark arts. They were trying to convert people to that persuasion. I don't know who converted them, but once they made the change, it was permanent. They didn't go back to their previous life. They renounced everything that happened before them, just like Paul did. He says, I consider it all what? Everything he had before as refuse on the ground. He said he didn't regard it with any longing whatsoever, um, and they did too, and they left it all behind. And then when they are, whenever these people are brought before the governors or pro councils or trials or whatever, the first goal is to get them to confess. And if they don't confess, we'll kill you. And then, you know, if you don't renege all of your beliefs, we're going to kill you. So there really is no way out of them. So it's better to die a noble um, for your beliefs than to besmirch your character and, and uh, live. So anyway, I just think these are very interesting cases, especially these guys, because they were, they were basically, um, I don't know what you call sorcerers. Sorcerers are what back, back in their day, but it's just an interesting case. Um, so that's all for tonight.